My wife is, is reading a devotional book from, uh, from Andrew Murray at the moment. So, Renee, look, I, you, you might have to share what, uh, you, you, you'll have to share a little bit about what, what you actually read from Andrew Murray in regards to John 15. Here you go. Oh, well, there's so much because the whole book is from John 15 called Abide in Christ. Awesome classic book. Um, I guess the one thing I just whispered to Paul now was that as, as much as we need the Father, as much as we need to, as branches, to be connected to the vine and how dependent we are on the vine for all of our nutrients as a branch um, and all of the power and the fruitfulness coming from him, um, God also needs us. He's dependent on us too. The vine needs the branches as well. That's where the, the leaves grow and that's where the fruit happens. And so God actually needs us as well. It's a beautiful, intimate relationship of dependence on each other. Pretty amazing, isn't it? So uh, thanks for all this you know, technological stuff here. It's been a fantastic, uh, 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 fantastic uh, morning of just uh, being challenged by all of the, the, the songs that have uh, come up. Um, but my name's Paul Reverstein. So I, I uh, run the organisation called Live Connection and uh, we, we partner with subsistent rural pastors um, in, uh, in 14 countries in Africa and the Philippines and Indonesia. So um, it's something that uh, when I met Renee all those 34 years ago in the bush of Africa where her father was training pastors in their own language to be missionaries into their community but they they needed a small amount of funding just to pay for the very basics of food to get their children into uh, into education or even just to give them medicine um, their child could die if they didn't have two dollars from Lero tablet so we started an organization it's been running for 23 years now and uh, for uh, for literally for two dollars thirty five a day for seventy dollars a month, you can partner with a subsistent rural pastor and if you'd like to uh, if you 'd like to be involved in that well just uh, just see me we 've got one hundred and ninety one pastors at the moment, and i 'm uh, pretty excited about getting to the two hundred by the end of the year. But what I want to talk to you about. Uh, this morning is about what makes the Father happy. What makes God happy? I mean, if, if we are uh, like sons and daughters of God, this is a good question, isn't it? Yeah? I think all of us want to know what makes God happy. And, uh, and let me just pull this back a little bit. Um, that is a, a cry of of every son and every daughter and uh, Jesus has the answer for us there so how did Jesus make his father happy well in John 15 verse 15 he says everything everything how much is everything everything's everything everything that I learnt from my father I have made known to you everything so as uh, there's no secrets in regard to how we can now make our Father God happy. And uh, I believe from what I've seen so far this morning that each and every one of you, your heart's desire is to make your Heavenly Father happy. And my first point um, is God, Jesus glorified his Father by living a sacrificial life for all. So a sacrificial life. If we get into the head of, of God and the head of Jesus, picture it. Before, they, before Jesus even left and came to earth, he was with the Father and the Holy Spirit and they came up with this staggering crazy plan and I'm sure the Godhead would have been talking together and saying what 
I'm going to leave heaven and I'm going to come to earth and I'm going to be born as a vulnerable baby and Father, is this the only way? What, I'm going to live till 33 years of age? Now, can I just have hands up for those that are under 33 years of age here? Mm, mm -hmm. I see one back there. Uh, so 33 is not an old life, is it? It's a young life. And the plan, before Jesus left heaven and came to earth, he agreed. He consented to this, this plan where at the age of 30 he would start his ministry he would live for three years and then die a horrific, brutal death. But my point here is that Jesus consented to living a sacrificial life for you and for I. It's staggering. If we, if we look at John 8.42... And Jesus said to them, I have not come on my own. God sent me. So his father sent him, but he knew what he was doing. It was, it was a decision, a choice he made before he left earth. Mark 10, 45, for the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. But then he says, but to give his life a ransom for all. How does Jesus make his father happy? By living a sacrificial life. He knew that he came to give his life a ransom for all. Do we think it's any different for us? Do you think that we, we are asked to do anything different than that? Do we escape this? Is this just for Jesus? Or maybe the trickling in our churches are because maybe we haven't come to that choice where we're willing to literally give our life sacrificially for all. I know for myself this is challenging. I know I need to look into this area. But before Jesus left this place in heaven and came to earth, he decided, he made a choice to give his life for us. And as we've had some beautiful prayers and sharing today in beautiful songs, it's for us also to come to that point in our life where we make a choice, a decision to live a sacrificial life. So many people will sacrifice for the things that, 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 um, that they want to sacrifice for. But Jesus sacrificed his life for all. He knew his life calling. He said in John chapter 3, verse 4, 14 to 17, Just as Moses lifted up a snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save it through him. These were the words he uttered while he was walking in his ministry life. Where did he decide? Where did he make that choice? He made that choice in heaven before he came to earth. And so he could walk his sacrificial life. In, in Luke 9, 22, he said, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. He must be killed and on the third day raised to life. Wow. Incredible, isn't it? For the Son of God, for God himself to consent, to make a choice to do that for us. 
But it wasn't an easy choice. In John 12, 27, when he was about to you know, go through this, this final hours before he would be betrayed, and he was sweating drops of blood and crying out to God in John 12, 27, now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. It was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. And so there was no escaping for God. Did he want to sacrifice his life? No. He didn't. But what did he do? He wanted to bring his father glory by living a sacrificial life. And so when he was even hanging on that cross, in Luke 23, 23 verse 34, he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Imagine that. Picture this. Um, picture it. it Looking from God's eyes, those people that were putting nails into his hands, that were beating him and crucifying him, were his sons and daughters, his creation. Imagine your own sons and daughters driving nails into your hand, spitting on you, kicking you, beating you. It, you couldn't imagine that. But Jesus actually was, went through this horrific circumstance because he wanted to bring glory to his Father. The job got done. The debt was paid for God's glory. So in John 17 verse 4, he says, I have brought you, Father, glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. He did it. He did it. And so Hebrews 13 verse 12, Jesus also suffered to make the people holy through his blood. He's made you and I holy and Everyone who calls on the name of Jesus. And the reason you'll get a lot of scripture today is because it's not Paul's gospel, it's Jesus' gospel. So the whole good news message is coming from the scripture. In Hebrews 2 verse 9, Jesus now crowned with glory and honour because he suffered death so that by the grace of God he might taste death. For who? everybody for everybody he tasted death for everybody so as followers of Jesus is it going to be any different for you and for me unfortunately no Jesus sacrificed his life that we could live life and life to the full but we also have to have a cross death to live a cross life and so some of the scriptures that, um, that we're going to look at is in John 12, verse 24, Jesus says, Truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it only remains a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. And I believe that the power of the seed only emerges when the seed dies. This was, this was like a prophetic statement that Jesus even was declaring about his own death. A timeless truth for even for you and for I. That when we die to ourselves, we can produce much fruit. But it's, it's like every time, every time, you know, we, we walk into a situation, we've got to die to ourself that we might live selflessly and see people the way Jesus actually saw people. 
I remember a man called Alan Norling who um, was at Epping when I was a pastor there for five years and Alan said uh, that he believed the baptism of the Spirit was that every single situation and time that you came into a, a minister or to, 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 to be cr a, the presence of God, you would have to baptise yourself go under the water, die to yourself and come up with the heart and the mind of Christ. And that would happen periodically over and over and over again throughout your day. So the sinful fleshly self doesn't, of greed and selfishness and, and selfish desires do not overcome you and you can minister in a way that Jesus ministered. So death to self is the key to living the Christ with the, the life where Christ is in you. There's no other way. Matthew 16, verse 24 said, Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. It's quite plain, isn't it? That in order for us to live a life where we're going to give glory to God, we ourselves have to live a sacrificial life. So in Paul the Apostle in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 14 says, For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that if one died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and was raised again. So from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Jesus glorified his father by living a sacrificial life for all and he's saying for us to grab hold of this deep truth, to see the kingdom grow, to give God glory, we too will live a sacrificial life. My second point was Jesus glorified his father by living a life of love. John 15 verse 13, greater love has no one than to lay his life down for a friend. In John 13, 34 to 35, similar to the songs we've been singing, a new commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you. How has he done that? Well, you must love one another. By this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one one another. Easy words to say, aren't they? But to love to the point where we would lay our life down for someone. I think that, um, I think we would all see a lot more fruit in our lives when we would love to that depth that we would be willing to even give our life for those that do not know Jesus. And I don't believe that's saying that we've literally got to give our life, but we would treat them like the most sacred individual that has ever come into our presence. My commandment, John 15, 12, is this, a commandment. Love each other as I have loved you. Matthew 22 verse 40, love your neighbour as yourself, all the law and all the prophets hang on these two commandments. And I don't believe we love people to convert them. We love them because that is what Jesus did. He loved even the people that were, were, were putting nails into his hands. He, wasn't, he was not thinking of converting them he was he was realizing he was making a pathway for them but I believe that in our lives we cannot ever put manipulation and control on another individual that is not love but to love sacrificially will get them asking those questions about why we love the way we do and so Paul in 1 Corinthians 16 verse 9 obviously says do everything in love and then let me say if you are a believer in Christ Romans 13 verse 8 says let no debt remain outstanding except 
the continued de- continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. Do you know that you have a debt? Some of you might even be mortgage free, and that's great. You own a home, fantastic. But you're not debt free from this scripture according to the word of God. Because of what Jesus has done for you, you have a debt to him to love one another. That's what the word says. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. Because of what Jesus has done for us, we have a debt to love one another. So, how does that happen? Well, Lorraine, st- stand up, please. Yeah, come. Yeah. So, if, if, if I come across anybody as a person of God, when I look at them, I look into their eyes and I see somebody that God has made cherished, precious in their eyes. I mean, you know that there's never, um, there's, that your, your eye configuration is, is uh, never ever been made from the beginning of time. And, you know, as we know, when we go through an airport, they can look into your eye and, and welcome you out of billions of people in the world back into Australia. And so, yeah, it is. But it's, it's like, I, I'm, like I'm on holy ground. I could take my shoes off because I'm in the presence of somebody created by God, somebody God died for. They may not know Jesus yet, but God has been wooing this person to himself continuously even though she may not even have heard of Jesus Christ and so for me it's it's almost like when I'm with a person I believe Jesus would have us even give non-verbal communication affirming the person valuing the person respecting the person and so you've got this this hidden language which is going continuously because of the debt that I have to love and the sense of honour and that is that is different to the world because the world will come and will talk with someone and will will actually say what can I get from you how are you going to benefit me what are you going to do to make my life better but the love of God is looking at a person and even giving them the freedom the choice the willingness to choose Jesus or himself. Jesus himself doesn't, doesn't force himself upon us. But as now, as ambassadors of God, with the debt to love, we are here and we stand in front of every single person that God brings into our path with this sense of sacredness, this sense of holiness, that, that you know, this encounter with God is sacred. And, and so I'm going to ask you about your life, about what God, you know, what, what, without even saying what God is doing, I'm going, to, I'm going to be asking you what's happening and, and looking at how I can actually serve you sacrificially, how I can benefit you and you can, you can even, you know, we can receive as well from that person. But that is actually how that you will see somebody who doesn't know God potentially start asking you questions about who you are because because of the Christ in you. But unless Christ is in me, unless I'm going to look at people with that sense of love, that sense of sacrifice, how 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 on earth are they going to see Jesus in me? How how is the church going to grow? How are we going to fill a church if we are only going to bring ourselves into this situation. So thank you. But it's incredibly important that our love for one another goes further than just um, our own agendas or our own manipulation or our own control. But it actually looks into the very heart of person, into the very, into the very eyes and, and just says, I value you, I honour you. You are sacred to God and so you are sacred to me. And my final point is that Jesus glorified his father 
by bearing fruit. As Renee has beautifully put, the vine needs the branches too. The, 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 the grapes do not grow off the vine. Uh, the, 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 they, they, they grow off the branches, right? And so we are the branches. And so there's this sacred right, relationship where he's calling you and I to partner with the gospel. In some ways, it's, it's why Jesus said in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse, verse 14, that we are the fragrance of the gospel, the sweet smelling aroma where in chapter 3 verse 3 we're like the living letter to be read by all that Jesus is alive how he is in me he is flowing through the vine into the branches and so I love it in in 2nd Corinthians chapter um, uh, uh, I think it's 4 verse 17 he says we carry a spirit of freedom upon our life right because we're not trying to control we've got no agendas we're just we're there to bring God in us into people and so second Corinthians chapter 5 verse 20 we are his ambassadors we represent God to the world right we we, we and we cannot disfigure him by the way we live and so we need to live that sacrificial life that life of love and you know um, that the beautiful thing is in, in verse 16 of that chapter 15, John 15 passage, you did not choose me but I chose you and appointed you so that you may go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so you have been commissioned as uh, was beautifully said in that, that um, church prayer. You have been commissioned. And things we don't like to talk about, we like to keep a little bit under the wraps, is 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17, which talks about we will be rewarded and judged on the basis of what we do. Um, we uh, sort of don't like that because we sort of like God to show no partiality. Hey, but I mean, scripture, scripture, and it's not our gospel. Um, Peter said, and remember that your heavenly father to whom you pray has no favourites. Great, fantastic. He will judge or reward you according to what you do. So you must live in reverent fear of him during your time as foreigners in the land. He will judge or reward you according to what you do. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure if I've said this, I've spoken once before here, but, you know, we've got to take everything that God has entrusted in us. I mean, we, when, when God wants to minister through us, he wants to minister through you, through your personality, through um, your mannerisms and your quirkiness and, and into the network and the contact of people that he has you. It's almost like Jesus becomes you with your personality, your, your funny little ways, and ministers in the context of your life. And, uh, and we can waste that life. We can, we can bury that life, can't we? Um, but, you know, Wayne Cordero said that graveyards are the richest place in the world. Why? Because people are finishing their lives without bearing fruit. And uh, he said, we've only got a limited lifespan for God. You know, we all know that one year is how many days? 365 days. So 10 years is approximately 306, uh, three, 3,650 days. That's 10 years. Just... 30 years is, is 10,950 days. 40 years, if you're lucky enough to have 40 years, then you've got 14,600 days left. And if you're even luckier, you've got, well, sort of luckier, you've got 50 years of life left 
at 365 days, you've got 18,250 days left. My point is, I'm two thirds of the way through my life. How are you going? How many days left do you have to bear fruit, to live for God's glory? And how will you spend those days? Will you spend them allowing God's, you know, God's uh, um, energy and power to flow through your life? Are you going to live a sacrificial life, a life of love? I think the world at this point sees the church as, as someone who is judgmental and critical and, and looks at behaviour over and above just love. And allow the Holy Spirit to do the convicting and, and the, the, the drawing. But he calls us to love. How is your countdown? It makes you feel quite mortal, doesn't it? You know, Very sobering. How many years do you think you've got left? Do you think you've got 10 years left? 3,650 uh, 3, days? Do you, do you reckon you've got 20 years left? 7,300 days. The point is, it doesn't matter how many days you've got left, but what are you going to do with those days? How are you going to live out your Christian walk? How are people going to see that the sacrificial God lives in you, that the God of love consumes you? Well, Matthew 7 verse 12 in the message says this, Here's a simple rule of thumb for behaviour. Ask yourself what you want people to do for you, then grab the initiative and do it for them. For this sums up the law and the prophets. Ask yourself the question, what do you want people to do for you? Well, faithfulness, honesty, generosity, acceptance... I suppose treated like family, not to be judged, to be accepted, celebrated for who I am, not who I'm not, to laugh, to cry, to be stretched, to enjoy good food together, whatever it is. The bottom line is, wherever there is a need, where there's a problem, where there's some darkness, we want to be there, shining the light of Jesus' love, which bears fruit. And I want to leave you with one more verse from Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19 and 20. It says, what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and our joy. I suppose we want to bring God glory, but the Apostle Paul was saying, in some ways, if there was going to be a pocket of glory we could potentially grab hold of, it would be that we would glory in the presence of the Lord comes when we would actually be used by him as, as somebody that would um, be his branch attached to his vine to bring about a soul into eternal glory. So, everything that I've learnt from my Father, I've made known to you. A life of sacrifice. Jesus lived a life of sacrifice for us and is calling for us to live a life of sacrifice for others. Jesus went to whatever sacrifice was necessary that we, that you and I could be free and whole. And he would ask us to do the same for the people that are in our sphere of influence. Are we willing to sacrifice for people born in our image so that they may encounter Jesus in us and become truly whole and truly alive? Can we live a life of sacrifice so that people in our orbit have the opportunity to know God 
to be all and be all that he's made them to be. And love, everything that I've learnt from my Father, I've made known to you. Jesus lived a life of love and is calling us to live a life of love. Are we willing to love people born in our image so that they may encounter Jesus in us and become truly whole and truly alive? Jesus is calling us to live a life of love to bring our Father glory and bearing fruit. Everything that I've learnt from my Father I've made known to you. And Jesus brought many sons and daughters into the kingdom and he's calling for us to live a life of bearing fruit for the Father's glory. Let me pray. Father God, um, we would pray that we would be consumed by you. That Lord God, we would realise that um, the, the way you lived is, is not the way you lived, but the way you're calling us to live. And that level of sacrifice, that level of love, that level of, of connectedness and abiding in you that is the, the only way that we can actually bring glory to our Heavenly Father. We pray that you would teach us, instruct us, prompt us, guide us, empower us to live that life to the best as we possibly can. For you, be all the glory and praises forever. Amen. Amen.